Hello and welcome to our webcast today on how COVID-19 is spurring an AI-driven digital experience. I'm Denise Stahlhoff, Senior Researcher at the Conference Board with a focus on consumer and marketing topics. Our webcast today has AI in the title, but our conversation today will focus on leveraging AI for business objectives. And our speakers are digital marketing experts, and they are very used to talking and working with all kinds of businesses about using tech to improve their business. So let me introduce our speakers. Uh, first, Mike Moran. Mike is an expert on digital marketing, search technology, social media, text analytics, machine learning, and web metrics. He worked for IBM for 30 years and rose to the ranks to executive level. And in one of his jobs there, he was in charge of the IBM.com web experience. And he led a big global team of a variety of tech experts to make that customer experience happen. Mike is actively involved in the industry as a consultant to a variety of companies as a speaker, board member, book author, and columnist for Biznology. Welcome, Mike, and thanks for joining us today. And then we have Tim Peter. Uh, Tim is an expert in digital marketing strategy and execution. He has been a consultant for many years on e-commerce, digital marketing, online customer service initiatives, and content personalization. Like uh, Mike, he has worked with a range of companies, from Fortune 500 companies to startups and everything in between. Before he became a consultant, he worked with hotels and resorts globally to grow their online revenue. He is a speaker and author and also teaches executive and professional audiences on his subject areas at Rutgers Business School and New York University. Welcome, Tim, and thanks for being with us today. Denise, thank you for having me. Looking forward to it. And at the conference board, we're really lucky to have both Mike and Tim involved in a variety of capacities. Um, they're actually together program directors of our digital marketing strategy, as well as our digital leadership and transformation council. And they are also um, co-directors of our upcoming conference on AI and marketing, which is happening on October 15th. We'll share more information. Actually, there is something in the chat box already, but we'll talk a little bit more later in the webcast about that. And you'll also get a discount code if you're not a member of the conference board. So let's move on here. Um, before we start the discussion, some housekeeping items. You can get CTE credit for attending this webinar. You just have to follow the prompts on the screen. We will have three poll questions for you, and we would love your engagement. Um, and we also encourage audience questions. Mike and Tim are true experts on digital marketing, so whatever questions you might have, please uh, share them. And now a quick uh, overview of our program today, um, the topics we'll discuss. First, we'll talk about AI in marketing, um, things like how is AI even used to improve customer experience and to, uh, to advance our marketing purposes, and what are, what are benefits of using AI uh, for marketing. And then, uh, you know, going back to the title of our webinar today, what kinds of developments and changes has COVID-19 brought about for, for the use of AI for marketing purposes? Then the second topic area is how to improve customer experience, and not just you know for for any goal, but to improve business. And there we'll talk about um, uh, about you know customer experience is very related to personalization. But the question is, what do consumers even think about personalization? And you know, thinking of increasing sensitivity about data privacy. How can companies personalize while still preserving data privacy? Um, we'll also talk about AI-based customer service, such as uh, chatbots, for example, um, and then improving websites. Of course, websites are such a central piece of digital marketing. And talking about you know, uh, how 
can we improve them? And Mike and Tim are true experts in that. They work with company on, companies on these topics every day. <clears throat> so we'll hear from them uh, to get some tips. Um, and then last but not least in this uh, section, uh, how can we measure business impact of all these um, tweaks that companies might be making to websites, for example? And then our third topic area will be implementation topics, including uh, marketing talent. Of course, to make AI happen, we have to think about the talent that, that works on this and how these uh, diverse teams collaborate. Um, and then also, you know, we have, of course, a lot of tech, and we'll talk a lot about tech today for, for business impact, but also not to forget about the human interaction and the human touch points and how can we balance those tech and human touch points to get the best of both worlds and optimize uh, experiences and business. All right, so uh, let me ask Mike and Tim just for an opening statement. Um, obviously, AI has been around for a while, and marketers have been using it for a while. But just from your point of view, um, to give us a perspective on where we are, in companies using AI for marketing. Can you describe that in some way? Maybe have an image or even a metaphor to uh, give us some indication of the status quo. Mike, do you want to start? Sure. Um, when I talk to marketers, I'm often reminded of uh, how people feel when they're about to undergo a fraternity hazing. So they, well, they're walked into the room blindfolded they know something distasteful is about to go on, but they have to go through it in order to get the thing they really want. And I feel like AI feels that way to them. It, they, they know they want the, val the value of it and the benefits of it, but as they're going into it, it's a little scary, it's a little unknown. They're not really sure what they're getting into or whether they're up to this. And so I think there's a lot of self-doubt on the way in, but... Uh, for those who go through the hazing, they do get to have the fun on the other side. Okay, well, thank you so much. We might not be uh, ever thinking the same way about AI <laughs> again. And, and Tim, what are your thoughts? So the way I think of it is, is we're sort of in the cave painting days. You know, we are still in the early days for a lot of businesses. I realize people have been working with us for some time in many cases, but it's still very early compared to where we are going to be. And I think most marketers are sort of homo sapiens at this point. You know, all the cave paintings have been done by the crow magnons. We know that the pictures need to get prettier and they need to get better. And folks are starting to look at how do we move into that realm. You know, I expect we're starting to enter a little bit of a trough of disillusionment around, uh, around AI marketing. And folks are starting to say, great, we've done some cool stuff. Now let's start doing more things that deliver business results. Awesome. Well, let's hope that, you know, maybe things like this, our webcast and our upcoming conference will contribute to moving us from that case stage forward. All right, so let's launch our first poll question to get um, the views of our audience. Um, the question is, how can AI most improve the customer experience? Is that by providing AI-based customer service? by personalizing emails and product suggestions, by noticing trends faster, uh, by optimizing websites, or by auto-completing forms and other types of text. So let's see what our audience thinks. Give it another couple of seconds. Okay, let's close the poll. All right, we have a, a winner, which is noticing trends faster is number one. Then we have a tie in the second place, providing AI-based AI customer service and personalizing emails and product suggestions. And then we have another couple on the third, uh, in third rank, uh, optimizing websites and auto-completing forms. So what do you think? Any reactions to the results, Tim? Uh, I'm not surprised. I mean, one of the core uses we've seen people use uh, AI for a lot is things around predictive analytics and understanding data more rapidly and the like. So that doesn't surprise me. Um, 
What I think is surprising is when you look at items like optimizing websites or auto-completing forms and text and the like, I would expect to see that be higher because we're, what we're doing right now with AI off, um, in many cases is we're trying to use it to do things we've always done but faster as opposed to saying how do we actually use this, med this medium, how do we actually use these tools to create new and better experiences for our customers that are beyond what they've seen in the past. You know, I'd sort of equate it to, if you think back to old movies, when movies first came around, all they did was point a camera at people on a stage. They really didn't use what film could be to create a wholly different experience for the audience. They simply shot a picture of what they'd always be doing. And it wasn't until people started to say, we can move the camera, and we can edit, and we can do close-ups, and we can do other things, that the language of film evolved. And I think that's sort of where we need to begin to move to, to say these tools shouldn't just be doing the things we've always done faster. They should start to create new and better experiences for our customers in a way that's really meaningful and helps drive business results. Yeah, I, I agree mm -hmm. with that. I think that, uh, that, Tim, you're pointing out something that I think a lot of people overlook, which is that often technology is first used to automate the thing that we already are doing, right. like you were saying. And the film example is a really great one. Um, I also am, uh, am actually a bit troubled that things like optimizing websites are so low um, because one of the things that I think is a problem with AI uh, in the way it's used today is if you, and you mentioned predictive analytics, which are really valuable, um, but if you look at something like noticing trends faster, the question is what actually is the value of that? So if you think about what's the business value of noticing trends faster, well, there's only two ways that that's valuable. The first way is if a person notices the trend and then does something quickly enough that you're taking advantage of that trend before you would have. But, and that's how most people are thinking about it. I think more interesting, even beyond kind of predictive analytics, as you were describing, and for those folks who don't know what that is, you can think of like an example like lead scoring where you're looking at certain characteristics of a person and you're predicting which person is more likely to buy from you. Or things like looking at the churn models and customer loyalty models, which customers are likely to stay with us. Basically what the AI is doing is predicting that something that will happen. But if you think about it, what's really interesting is something like prescriptive analytics, which takes that prediction and it has the, the computer actually take an action so that so you get benefit immediately so if you see a trend faster and you've tied it to some computer action that's automated now you might get benefit really quickly out of that whereas a lot of times when you're looking at looking at trends and things and you show it to a person the first thing they do is scratch their head and go huh hmm what do we do with that Right? And so the fact that you found it faster may not be that helpful if you can't react faster. And so I think a, some of us might need to think about different ways of connecting whatever those insights are to the value in order to really start picking up the benefits of AI much more quickly and rapidly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It sounds like um, AI, like sort of like the whole package, you know, from you know, you discover trends, but then you also get um, suggestions for, you know, what to do with, with that. Yeah. Tim, did you want to add something? Yeah, I, was gonna, I, I completely agree with what Mike's saying and, and with what you just said, Denise. You know, I always think of your website or your app as your 24 by 7 salesperson or your 24 by 7 customer service rep. And when you use AI to do predictive analytics or to look at the data and analyze trends, it's like that salesperson or that customer service rep, every time they uncover a problem, has to turn around and ask you, their manager, what do I do now? And that's not actually as helpful as simply saying, I'm going to solve this customer's problem or I'm going to progress this sale faster, which is what you actually want from a business perspective. Mm -hmm. Right. Actually, so the slide that you're seeing now here is actually, these are results from a survey that we did last year with marketing executives. And we asked them, how is your company using AI for marketing purposes? Uh, we didn't have all the items that were in the, in the previous poll, but what we found last year, again, this is not the most current data, but the question, so what we found is that 
better targeting uh, customers and personalization, those were items that really bubbled to the top. The, um, what's getting close to identifying trends uh, better is like the social media uh, listening. But my question to you would be, is like the use of AI in marketing to better target and personalize, what, how, are, where are we on that now? Is that also a key use of AI? I think it is, and, I, and they're very related. So uh, um, if you think about what's going on with uh, targeting and personalization, they both are about trying to identify people who can be influenced by certain messages, right? So the personalizi personalizing part of it is the kind of the identification of delivering the messages. But the targeting is really about who are the groups you're trying to attract that you think will be interested in those messages. And they're very related, right? Because you could have a terrific message but be attracting the wrong people, right? Similarly, you could be attracting the right people, but the message isn't actually tuned to be as influential as you thought it would be. And so those things are really tightly related. You can do them individually, but often they're done together. So the fact that they showed up so high in the survey doesn't really surprise me because that's a real tangible benefit that you can get out of AI and marketing today. Yeah, And, and that goes to, to sorry, the please, business no, impact, ahead. right? Yeah. No, I was just going to say that really goes to the business impact um, that we talked about. Tim, you were, you were going to mention something. Yeah, I was going to, I was going to go on to the third one as well because when we talk about how we track the customer journey across channels, you know, what the reason you want to do that is because you want to say what is the right message to put in front of this customer at this point in their journey or in this channel or in this context. You know, I'm, I'm a big fan of saying, you know, content is king and customer experience is queen. And the idea here is in certain contexts, you need to have a different experience and say, now is the right time to present this information. And that's a great opportunity to use AI to say, what is that message we need to be delivering at this point? What are the things that actually help them? And especially, what are the things that not only help our customers, but help guide them to a conversion action that we as a business care about? Mm -hmm. And if I can add one other thing, I'm, there's a white paper, there's a company we work with that has a white paper on AI that I'm going to share in the chat called uh, AI Webinar is the link, and you are more than free to download that if you would like. So we'll see you awesome. in a second. I see another question I was going to ask you is about, you know, we have in our audience, we have uh, B2C as well as B2B uh, marketers. So in terms of AI for marketing in these two different types of sectors, do you have any thoughts on that? Is it the same? Is it, you know, even in terms of how much is it used, uh, how far are companies along, how much is it needed? Um, any thoughts or experience on that? Mike, do you want to go first on this one or do you want me to jump sure. in? You go um, ahead. I think you'll have a better answer, Tim, because you <laughs> actually have a lot more experience with B2C customers than I do. Well, one of the things I, I know from working with a lot of B2B customers is that the kinds of things you're trying to do are similar, but the technologies that you use to do them are often different. So there's a, if you, if you think about kind of a classic personalization interaction on Amazon, like, uh, you know, customers who looked at this product eventually bought these products. That's, that's in AI called a CVM model, customer also viewed model. And so that CVM model works really, really well, but it's based on transaction data. So it's based on the fact that Amazon knows that lots of people who looked at certain things bought other things, and they have loads and loads of people who did that. And they know hundreds of people who looked at these things and bought other things. But think about that in a B2B context. I mean, if you're trying to sell, um, you know, uh, piping to a manufacturer and say, hey, we, we think you should use our pipe in your new product, I mean, how many, how many transactions do you think you get on that? And once somebody <laughs> buys one, does that mean that the next person who comes along should buy the same one, right? It doesn't really work that way. And so even though you're trying to still recommend content, you might need to use a different kind of AI model that actually understands what the content is about rather than saying, hey, this is product A, there's product B, 
customers who looked at product A bought product B, that's not really helpful. The other thing that's true in B2B is that if you make that sale that says, hey, we decided to buy the pipe and put it in the machine, that is one sale that might, be, that might cause you to become a supplier to that company for years, for millions of dollars, whereas the transactions that happen in consumers are mostly things that are, are uh, quite different. So if you buy a book on a certain subject, you're probably interested in buying other books on that subject. But once I pick my pipe supplier, I'm not looking for more pipe suppliers. So a lot of the algorithms that work for B2C don't really work for B2B. And so you have to kind of uh -huh. know what you're looking for to know which things are actually going to work for you. Well, so it's definitely a scale, you know, sort of the amount of data you have even to make these uh, predictions and needs, customer needs. Tim, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I was going to say it's exactly that. It's all around where your data sets start. A big use we see of AI in B2C in you know many industries is around pricing and pricing analytics. But of course, you're only going to do automated pricing or things along those lines based on lots of transaction data and volumes of sales and the like. And B2B tends not to have that kind of data. It's not how the products are sold. So there tends mm -hmm. to be more focus on, you know, AI being applied to the operations side of the house in B2B, whereas you see it more on, or, or on the product side of the house, uh, and much more on the, you know, on the promotion and pricing side of the four Ps, if we can bring that old model off the shelf and, you know, blow the dust off of it, uh, when we think about what's happening from that perspective. So you're seeing, mm -hmm. you're seeing just, it's, it's really based around, where do you consume the data? A friend of mine has a great line that I love. A, a buddy of mine has a line that he says, you know, um, AI makes big data little. And so if you think about where the large data sets in, uh, live in a B2C type business versus a B2B type business, that's where you tend to see AI being put to use and why it differs. And I think mm -hmm. one of the things that's really important for this audience um, is that if you think about what's happened in technology over the last 25 to 30 years, as the web has come in, as cloud has come in, it's been a real democratization around technology so that what's happened to large companies, who I assume are most of the folks who are on this call, is they have all these smaller companies that are nipping at their heels and able to suddenly do things very quickly and easily that only a large company could do before. AI is a little bit of a different animal because the fuel of AI is data, and big companies like yours have a lot of data, way more data than a startup is going to have. And so you have this huge advantage if you can tame AI in your organization, get the data working. I know in a big organization it's always hard to do projects like this, but this is, you know, this is kind of the fraternity hazing analogy. It's going to be <laughs> in the beginning. But it's going to be really good when you get there because this is how, this is kind of the revenge of the big companies. This is how larger companies with big data sets have real differentiated advantage against small startups. And so this is an opportunity that really large companies should not be passing by. Yeah, if I could uh -huh. add one last thought to that. You know, it's one of the things that, that Mike just said that is so key is obviously artificial intelligence, machine learning tools, you know, natural language processing algorithms, et cetera, all feed on data. And it is just as easy to train an artificial stupidity as it is to train an artificial intelligence. So getting your data house in order and making sure that you, you're putting your data in you know, the types of places where you can consume it and feed it into an AI becomes really important so that you can build these algorithms and actually make them work for your benefit. Mm -hmm. That's actually a really good segue into our next topic. We already talked about personalization. And you talked about the need of data. Of course, that requires people willing, being willing to share their data. And we recently did a global survey of consumers to find out how willing they are, uh, they are to share data um, or you know, whether they would be willing to give up personalization if they could keep their privacy. And so let's do a, a poll. Let's ask our audience what they think. If we can pull up the next poll question. Can we get the poll question number two? Actually, there it is. So the question is, in which region are consumers most willing to give up personalization in exchange for not being tracked? 
is that the Middle East, Africa, Asia Pacific, Europe, North America, or Latin America? Okay, let's give it a couple of more seconds. Okay, let's close. We again have a clear winner, which is Europe here, followed by Asia Pacific as well as North America. And then we have Latin America. So what are your thoughts on this? Would this be uh, consistent with your expectations? Yeah, I would have expected Europe just because um, in the work that I've done with European companies, I've noticed going back a decade or more a lot of concern about this, and I think that's why GDPR emerged in Europe, even though I think there is interest in other parts of the world. You see the California regulation that's come in, but this would have been what I would, would guess. I don't know if it's correct according to the, the, the study that you did, but it's, but it's definitely what, what my guess would have been. Mm -hmm. And you, Tim? I can, I, I, I hate to just say me too in this case, but in this case, yes, me too. I mean, I completely agree. <laughs> GDPR is obviously a challenge that um, everybody is, you know, I'm sure most people on this call are, are dealing with. Obviously, we have CCPA has come in. We've got some uh, regulations down in Latin America. But primarily, uh, Europe is where I would expect to see this number come up. Yeah, so let's review our results that we got. Maybe there's, there is a little surprise. So these graphs show the willingness, the, the dark blue line shows the willingness of people to give up uh, personalized content in return for not being tracked. And we see that North America, we actually have the highest percentage of people willing to give up personalization. It's actually around 55%, so more than half of consumers are willing to give up personalization. So maybe in Europe, um, it, you know, you, or people saw, or maybe it's it's actually lower here for Europe because there is more data protection and people right. feel more comfortable sharing data. But the question is, you know, seeing this high number in North America in particular, so what kinds of tools or, you know, tricks can companies, not tricks, but, you know, what kinds <laughs> of solutions are there for companies to still personalize, even if you want, and still preserve data privacy to make people comfortable? Are there any solutions that, that are available? So, I mean, yes. Actually, this is a place where AI can play an enormously useful role to you in that we know from lots of different sources that behavioral data is actually the most predictive data that exists in terms of saying what's a customer likely to do. And so you don't need to know a lot about an individual uh, in terms of, you know, their demographics or their psychographics or things or their firmographics if you're a B2B company to do this where an AI can, can look at behavior patterns during an interaction and say this is the right thing to offer a customer at this stage in the journey. And it makes a ton of sense. It's something where, as, as you think about it, especially in a B2B environment and especially with people working from home, and I'm kind of jumping a little ahead to what's going on with COVID and the like, but people not working in offices, a lot of the tools that we used to use in B2B personalization no longer work or can't work as effectively because you're not coming from a, a shared IP address. You're not coming from an office building. You've got people distributed all around the countryside, all around the world working from home. And so leaning on other types of data that are not personally identifiable and aren't going to be blocked by, you know, cookie deletion and aren't going to be blocked by ITP and ETP and things like that, uh, um, intelligent tracking protection or um, enhanced tracking protection in, in the browsers, um, just is a huge advantage of stuff AI can do for you that there is no better way to do. And even better, it complies with GDPR and it just complies with CCPA and the like because you're not tracking it or you're not collecting or storing any, any PII, any personally identifiable information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that, uh, that Tim laid out a good set of uh, kind of environmental restrictions that are starting to crop up, whether it's uh, cookies expiring after seven days or what's coming next is third-party cookies going away. and. Uh, um, he mentioned how visitor identification, kind of reverse IP lookup is failing now that, now in a post-COVID world, um, and obviously privacy regulations like GDPR. Those are all making it harder for you to know who the person is. But 
the th but the other thing that I think we need to focus on is actually what's in this poll that you have, which is what do customers <laughs> actually want, right? The reason all those environmental things are happening are because people actually don't want to give up their information until they do, right? So when they're ready to have a salesperson contact them or in B2B to C, when they're ready to buy, then they're going to tell you who they are, uh, but they're not willing to tell you who they are before that. And if you think about what we need to do, it, it, what we need to do is the same kind of thing we do in brick and mortar experiences. If you think about how you make a purchase today, there's all sorts of personalization that's based on behavior and based on you asking questions. And so if you, if you walk into the computer aisle at Best Buy, there's going to be a computer that's running some kind of self-mode demo about it. There's going to be all sorts of posters and signs telling you about um, all the interesting capabilities of this machine, and it has a touch screen, and blah, blah, blah. And so this is kind of a personalized experience, if you think of it, because you walked into that aisle. And so now they have kind of thought, what is it that a person who walks into this aisle wants to see? And so your behavior has kind of told them what you're interested in. But then if a salesperson walks by and you ask them, hey, I have a couple of questions. I'm on a really tight budget. Um, I want to buy a, a, a machine for my kid who's going off to college, and uh, you know he's he's going to be walking around with it and bringing it to class, and he's going to use it on his bed and move it to the desk. And I don't want something that's going to break while he's away at school, so I want it to be kind of rugged. But I'm also on a budget, and uh, I you know I don't want to pay a lot, right? Now you have revealed an awful lot about what you're interested in, and you've got questions you want answers to. But this salesman doesn't have the slightest idea who you are. And so doing the same kind of thing on your websites and in other marketing, where you're looking at behavior, you're looking at what kind of questions people ask, and they can ask questions in a chat, they can ask questions in your site search. There's all sorts of ways for them to do that, right? And their behavior, like walking into the aisle, means we walked into a section of the site. We started looking at this page. We scrolled down this much on the page. There's all sorts of behaviors that you can see, and I think that it's it's not just that you can collect these things because you can collect all that other data too that people don't want you to collect. It's that I think people are okay with you collecting this. Just like mm -hmm. they're okay in real life when you go into the, compu the computer aisle of Best Buy. They know mm -hmm. that you're getting information about them, but because you don't know who they are, it doesn't affect mm -hmm. them in the same way. And I think yeah. that's what we really should be thinking about. Mm -hmm. So using the behavioral data without identifying people, that seems to be, you know, the key here. That's actually, there's an audience question from Amy Davis. She, she asked about personalization efforts on disparate platforms, such as a website, CRM, marketing automation. How can that all be married, all those efforts, personalization efforts? That's actually a fairly difficult problem. <laughs> um, and, and I'm not sure it's the first one to tackle to be honest with you. I think that you'd be better off tackling the problem of how do you get value out of it on each platform. Because one of the things that I think you'll find is that people sometimes go into this idea of solving these problems in marketing by saying, okay, well, we got to get a data science team. And we have to pull all the data together. And we'll have the data science team figure out all the models. And that is actually a really expensive way to solve the problem. A much simpler way to solve the problem is can we look at what software we have in each of those areas? Is there any kind of AI widget in those softwares that could grab some of our data and just start working? Because then we will do a few things, right? We will very quickly solve the problem to some level. We'll show value right away. And if it turns out that the right next thing to do is to figure out how do you do this cross-platform um, improvement, because we've seen good improvement by working inside the platforms, but we really think that there's a pony in there if we figure out how to deal with all the crap, <laughs> how to figure out this cross-platform thing, then you'll have all sorts of value that you've already created that can let you go take that next step. But a lot of times I see people trying to take a really hard step first, and I wouldn't recommend it. I'd recommend doing the easy stuff first that will give you value and give you a track record of delivering value in the organization, so that way, when you do need to do something hard, you've got a leg to stand on when you're talking to people and, and looking for credibility for why they should believe in your idea. 
Yeah, completely mm -hmm. agreed. You can you can always add more data to the models later, and you know refine them and make them better. And you know, handoffs between systems and handoffs between experiences is so much easier once you've demonstrated that hey, we've got a model that works and we've got a model that improves performance. You know, there's an old joke uh, that I always think about in any kind of these initiatives that we talk to folks about. Of you know, there's the two guys who are walking through the woods, and suddenly a bear starts charging towards them. And you know, the, the first guy sits down and starts putting on running shoes. And the second guy says, what are you doing? You're never going to outrun that bear. And the first guy says, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. In any of these circumstances, you're not necessarily trying to you know, boil the ocean or bring it all together. You're trying to say, how do we actually improve where we are today in a meaningful way, in a way that produces a result, in a way that gets us more funding to do the next thing? You're not trying to outrun the bear. You're just trying to outrun the other guy to start with. Right. And, and mm -hmm. the thing to think about is that, uh, you know, everybody's like, well, we have to do all this stuff because we're never going to be as good as Amazon. Well, unless Amazon is one of your competitors, you don't care, right? If your competitors are as sleepy as you are, you just need to be the smartest <laughs> in the dumb class, right? If you're doing a little better than them, that's going to make a better customer experience and be a real differentiator for your customers. Right. I see one thing, um, you know, hearing AI, people often think, uh, at least I think, of chatbots, you know, these intelligence machines that are able to have conversations with, with customers. And we did a survey this summer with C-suite executives around the world, and we asked them about what they envision to be long-term impacts of uh, COVID-19. And what we saw is that CMOs and chief communications officers they were way more likely than other C-suite executives to, um, to envision that their companies would provide more self-service options, for example, chatbots. My question to you is, and that's probably a reflection of you know, being more efficient and also avoiding wait lines you know, during COVID, everybody was online or is, has been online. Um, being efficient and also increasing, enhancing customer experience by not having to wait, by you know, being able to, to, to get what you want at any point. But my question to you is, where are, how is what's the quality uh, now? You know, where are we? How advanced are these tools? So chatbots are still not terribly good, in my opinion. Um, you need to have some kind of trap door um, for when the chatbot fails. Uh, so most of the time that means a live rep. So for companies that don't want to take the expense of a call center that has live chat reps, I don't know that chatbots are really a solution for them. For those companies, I'd be much more likely to recommend pay a lot more attention to your site search. Try and figure out how the thing you already have could work a lot better because if people find their answer in site search, that's every bit as good of a self-serve experience as having a chat bot. And so if the reason you wanted a chat bot is because you didn't want to pay for live people to do chat, I think the technology isn't quite there yet. I don't think we've got chat bots that really can give you a better experience than a chat rep can, or even an equivalent experience. I think there. That if you, one way to think about the chatbots and the state of the art they are now is it's kind of like the automated part of the phone tree in the call center. You know, when you call that phone number and it asks you the first five questions and, you know, you, you answer them and, you know, how often do you really get your answer from that, right? I mean, do you, did, were you really calling just to find out the store hours? Um, because if you were, then maybe you got that answer, right? Or were you really calling to find the balance on your bill? If you were, then you probably got your answer through the automated system. But if you had anything more complicated than that, then probably you didn't get your answer. And you're just trying to figure out, what is the series of keys I can jab on my phone to get them to send me to a live person? <laughs> Unfortunately, chatbots are pretty close to that. They're not quite as bad as that, but they're closer to that than to be a substitute for a person. It sounds like, you know, it could, can even be counterproductive then because then people are frustrated, they don't get their answer, you know, they feel like they're, okay, so the website is the answer, which is actually a great segue in, into my, was my next question about, I know you both do a lot of website work and you work with AI, but, you know, how do you, 
and, and obviously the website is such a central piece of companies' digital marketing uh, strategies. How do you even identify how well a website works and you know, how can AI help enhance the website experience for customers? So, you know, the thing I would the thing I would start with is, and and Denise, I I fully fully acknowledge the the validity of the question. I also would kind of shift it a little bit because really, when we think about what your website is, it's it's a collection of your content, right? And many companies over the years, and and fortunately, folks are getting a lot better at this, but they've put a lot of emphasis on the frame, and not enough emphasis on the painting, not enough emphasis on what actually goes within the frame. And so, you know, it's more about do you have content that supports your customers at various stages in their journey? Do you have content that answers the questions that are most important to your, to your customer? Do you have search experiences that enable customers to get the answers to the questions that they have? Because then you can turn an AI on it to say, great, what's the right time to present content to people? Or what's the right time to actually measure the effectiveness of this piece of content at progressing that customer journey and saying we're getting them closer to either satisfying a customer service issue or you know closing a sale. So it's thinking about it from that perspective and saying, are we putting the right emphasis on answering our customers' questions and identifying our customers' needs in a way that the content supports them, and then we can put the pretty wrapper around it and all that, so that they're actually, you know, having a, a good visual experience to accompany that overall customer experience. But AI, mm -hmm. you know, pointing AI at a bad website is just going to, you know, make your make you faster at identifying all the things that the website is bad at, instead of saying what are the kinds of problems that customers need to solve and how can we help them solve them and do we have the right content for that and then how do we use an AI to actually bring that into effect more quickly uh -huh. for them. But it actually it sounds like it starts with, you know, really like the traditional approach, really knowing consumer needs or customer right. needs, you know, the small data and then combining it with, with big data. Yeah. Mike. Yeah, and so if you and so to really answer the question of of how the measurements work, the measurements aren't different for AI than they are for anything you're doing now, right? So if your goal if your goal is to drive more leads, well, it doesn't really matter whether you're using AI to do that or something else to do that. The way to measure it is, did it actually drive more leads? And so, and if the goal is to avoid a phone call to your really expensive call center um, because people found what they're looking for online, well, do you really care whether it was AI that did that or some other thing you tried that did that, right? So I don't think there's a special case of measuring AI. AI is a means to an end. So AI helps you do better things you're already doing. And so however you measure the value of the things you're already doing, add the AI to it and see if it actually measurably does it better. Mm -hmm. Actually, speaking of measuring impact, we have another audience question from Alan Irish. What would you consider the best takeaway from an abandoned shopping cart metric, and what is the best automated response to an abandoned cart? Well, I think, I'm not sure either of those are really AI questions, which is fine, but I think the, you know, the, the answer, the best takeaway from an abandoned cart metric is that this is a person who might be teetering on the edge of a buy. And so the best automated response is if you've got their email address, follow them up with email. If you've cookied them with, uh, you know, follow them around the web and retarget them, these are all things that I think we already know how to do. Um, I think an AI approach on this, I'm not sure whether it would be better or not, but one of the things that you could look at was whether there might be different patterns of behavior that they followed before they abandoned the cart, and maybe you could separate those groups um, based on those patterns into different cohorts and you could actually try and test different offers when you reach out to them. Maybe some of them will be more susceptible to a discount offer. Some of them might be more susceptible to some other type of offer where maybe you're throwing in some kind of service or adding an extra thing to it. And so if you've got several different possibilities, you might want to analyze the behavior pattern before the, the cart was abandoned and use AI to try and help you identify the best offer. But I mean, the, the, the simple thing is, is you don't need any AI to just make sure that you're following up with them and offering them something. Using AI, mm -hmm. you might be able to do something more personalized than that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I actually know of a specific example, and for, for 
you know, confidentiality reasons, I can't mention the company, but doing precisely what Mike's talking about in terms of identifying there are specific signals in the data that suggest this is a price conscious customer and they got to the shopping cart and something about the price at that point, whether it was taxes, whether it was shipping, whether it was something else, was what caused them to abandon. And so, you know, uh, reaching out to those folks with a price specific offer is more successful in those cases where other people's objections had, and in this specific case, they were able to identify that there was a price objection or it was a non-price objection, and that's as sophisticated as the model could get. But offering the non-price objection folks a discount didn't improve the, the return rate at all, didn't improve the conversion rate at all. So being able to say, for the folks who are price conscious, we're going to give them a value-based offer, a price-based offer, and actually return some of that business. And for the folks where it was a non-price objection, we're going to give them a different message, and that had some benefit as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, really practical, um, you know, suggestions. There's another audience question uh, from Didi, and that it goes back to what we talked earlier, um, for how, what the kinds of applications are for AI. How can AI support curated experiences? Is that one of the main uses, or? Go ahead. I'd, say, I'd say that the, that what you need to think about is how AI shifts what curation means. Right. So when we think about curated experiences, we think about how is how can we set up an experience that a person has actually um, crafted in order to influence other people. And if you think about that, that's kind of what a website is today. And so what you want to think about is not necessarily curation in, in its traditional sense of meaning I'm selecting some content for you to see. What you want to think of it in terms of in what in AI they call human in the loop AI. So it basically means that you don't just set the machine free and have it go run around and find some patterns and throw stuff up. What you do instead is you have human beings who are actually looking at what that data is and making some decisions. So sometimes the curation won't be I'm choosing a particular experience for people. It might be I'm helping to identify what are the important cohorts of users that, are, that should be identified by the AI. And now we're going to come up with ideas for what to test for what their experience should be that are different from the other cohorts. And so curation changes a little bit. There's also other types of human in the loop things, like one of the technologies Tim and I work with all the time is one that actually identifies what topic or subject yeah. content is about. And so you could just unleash the computer to just group all sorts of topics together, but the truth is when you do that, many of the topics don't make sense to people. They feel, they feel kind of like not on the same plane. Like I remember when we used this kind of technology at IBM, we, we said, hey, here's a bunch of, the computer came back and said, here's pages about relational databases. I'm like, oh, okay, that's something we sell, that's good. Then the, we look at the next one, it says, here's pages about technical support. And we're like, okay, that doesn't feel like it's in the same category. And then we look at the next one, it says, here's pages in French. I'm like, okay, okay, this <laughs> at all the same type of categories. So even though the computer legitimately found that those pages were different from each other in some patterned way, it didn't help because it wasn't really the kind of things that helped human beings to find things. And so by injecting some curation into that, having a human being look at it and say, yeah, technical support, French, those are dumb categories. We should take all the French documents out of this and look at those separately. Let's only look at the English documents now. And now let's see what is it that that the next topic is. If we tell it those are dumb, go look again. What does it do now, right? That's a way of curating a topic taxonomy that would actually give you something that not only can computers can do accurately, but they also make sense to the human beings who have to use that list of subjects afterwards. And so mm -hmm. curation is still a really important subject because having human beings tweak the AI is critical. That's how you get the best results nowadays, is to have human in the loop AI. But it isn't necessarily curation the way we've traditionally thought about it. Mm -hmm. So it's really combining uh, machines and human beings, which is another really great segue into implementation, and specifically talking about um, you know, talent. Um, so let's uh, pull up our next poll question. 
um, which is about marketing talent. Um, and the question is, what type of skills may marketing executives seek most for their team? Is it strategy and management skills, expertise in a certain industry, creative or an artistic expertise, specialist skills such as data analytics, AI, digital media, and so forth, or uh, left brain and right brain thinking, um, and lastly, soft skills such as collaboration skills, resilience, and so forth. Um, let's give it another couple of seconds. So, uh, so my guess kind of correlates with what I see coming up here, but I think for a particular reason. I don't think the people answering this question are saying these are the skills that are more important than the other skills. I think what they're really saying is these are important skills that we don't have, and that's why we're seeking them. Right? I think all of these skills are critically important to do a good job in marketing, and so I'm not sure that any of them are more important than the others, but I understand why the AI, digital media, consumer psychology is coming up, because these are the skills that are probably least likely to already be in the organization. And I think that's, mm -hmm. so, they, so they're really important and they're lacking. Yeah, so we can close the poll and actually let me introduce some results that we got last year from that same survey of marketing executives where we asked exactly this question. And this is in line with, you know, what we got on the poll, the most sought after talent are those specialist skills and probably as Mike said, because they're, you know, they're not on the team yet. Um, however, you know, question for you would be, how have you seen, you know, this digital talent, you know, collaborate with other kinds of people? Because it, it must be a very collaborative environment, not just with on the marketing team, people with very different skill sets, but also, you know, beyond marketing with, you know, the IT department and other, uh, and other departments. Do you have any, you know, words of wisdom about, you know, how to make everybody work well together? <laughs> I don't know about how to work well together. I, I suppose, you know, it gets back to your basic management principles of make sure people's incentives are aligned, make sure pe people understand what the common goal is, you know, but build cross-functional teams where people are working together on a common problem. I realize that might sound very obvious, but it really does come back to that again and again and again. The, you know, what's the phrase that is most used for this? I apologize. You know, the, the most interesting type of chess being played today is one where it is not humans against AIs and it's not AIs against AIs. It is humans paired with AIs uh, against humans paired with AIs, right? An AI is not going to take your job. An AI is not going to kill your business. A smart person who knows how to ask the right questions of the AI and knows how to collaborate with the team, who knows how to build the AI, are the folks who are actually going to be the ones who you have to worry about the most, right? It's a, it's the one who's a unicorn, right? They're a, a, a cyborg, you know, the person and the AI together is the most interesting bit. And so yeah. uh -huh. it's really about how you bring the team together just the way you would any other team to work to, towards a common purpose and a common goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Tim's right. I think uh, AI isn't going to take your job away, but if you don't use AI, you're going to lose your job to some other marketer who does. And so I think that's really the thing to be focused on. And, uh, and I, I agree with Tim. A lot of times you'll hear um, HR and talent executives talk about T-shaped skills, so that you go broad across soft yeah. skills, communication skills, things like that, but go deep in, in at least one thing. And I think that, that sometimes, because um, especially AI skills right now are so scarce, that we might be hiring people that, have those eye shaped skills. <laughs> right. have that communication ability. They can't really understand your business that well, but they're really good at you know putting together a model. And so that those are people that are going to have a harder time solving marketing problems than than others. They would be better off solving problems where you don't need as much communication across all of these different skills. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a really good incentive for teams to truly work together, to have all pieces in place to, you know, to make it happen. And so we're almost at the end of the webcast. So before, you know, I'll ask uh, Mike and Tim for like a final thought, let me um, 
I'll let the slide to give you some more information about this upcoming conference that I mentioned earlier, which is exactly around topics that we just talked about. And actually, Mike and Tim will be co-directors of this conference on October 15th. Mike, do you want to say a little bit more about the conference? Yes. So, um, so if you like this webinar, you'll like this even more because uh, the, the, the same type of approach that we took today is what we're going to take on October 15th. We're not going to be talking to you about uh, um, Boolean algebra and, uh, and uh, deep, far, deep learning and all sorts of uh, random forest algorithms. It's not about technology. It's about what you do with it. It's going to be practitioners just like you that are telling you their war stories, how they got their organization, another large organization like yours, to go along with this stuff, what happened when it didn't work the first time, and how they got them to hang in there until it did work, what kinds of use cases they did that are really valuable. And so we have some um, real experts from outside of those big companies, to folks like from Google, but we've also got folks from, from John Deere, from Thermo Fisher, from other large companies that, that those people are going to be telling you how it works to actually deliver AI in an organization and what kind of benefits they're really showing and how they prove the value of that when they were done. And I think for marketers, that's the real important stuff. The real important stuff is all the business topics around AI. It's not about the technology. I've found that you can get technology to do just about anything, but you have to know what you want and you have to know that it's going to work. And to us, figuring out that is really the hard part. And that's what we're going to talk about on October 15th. And uh, you can see here that you have a coupon code for $100 off if you are not a member, a member of the conference board. But really, why aren't you? You should be a member of the conference board. <laughs> Look at all the people on this webinar that are members of the conference board. They get in for free. And so um, the, the regular price is $295. $100 off with this coupon and free if you're a conference board member. So we hope we see you there. Awesome. Well, thank you. So before we close, um, let me ask you first, Tim, any uh, the one takeaway or the one recommendation that you have for, for our audience today on using AI for marketing? Absolutely. It's, we always have to start, as we talked about a little while ago, with what is it that the customer needs. AI is a tool. You know, when all you, there's an old expression that when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Don't go looking for the thing of, hey, what can AI do as you know, hammering this thing? Look for problems that need solving that you haven't been able to solve any other way, and then say, maybe this is a place where AI can solve because we're dealing with too much data or we're dealing with something we've not been able to address. I would look at it that way. Go find the problems that aren't being solved today. They haven't been solved for a reason, and that's probably where you want to focus your efforts. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And you, Mike, any any one takeaway? Yeah, I think one recommendation? Who spends a lot of time with B2B companies. I think one of the things that we've seen since the pandemic is that there are companies that are seeing a lot more traffic to their website but they're not actually getting more leads out of their website or conversions out of their website. And if they don't have in-person events anymore, they don't have trade shows, they don't have um, conferences where they bought a booth, where are those leads coming from? And so one of the places I would really be focused on is digital customer experience, and AI is a way for you to really easily figure out how to make your site better right away. It's something that can be done quickly using that kind of behavioral data that we talked about. And if you didn't click on the, uh, the link that Tim had put in the chat earlier, you really should go back and click on it because this is a quick way for businesses to be able to really improve their website. And in, in this pandemic-laden world that we've got, we need to find some way to make our website better easily and quickly rather than just losing all those leads that we had from traditional marketing. Awesome. Well, thank you so much both Tim and Mike for speaking on this webcast today. Also, thank you to our audience and thank you to our digital team who made this, uh, this webcast happen. You'll see in the slides some more resources uh, of upcoming webcasts and other resources from the conference board. 
And lastly, we would love your uh, feedback on this webcast so we can make our program you know, the best possible uh, for, for our members and everybody else who's uh, joining us. So thank you so much. We hope to see you on a future program and have a good rest of the day.